Welcome to New Hope Community Church. How are y'all this morning? He's got no mic. It's more that for you. It's going to be awesome this morning. Thanks for showing up today. Um, it's my opinion that it's no mistake that you're here. And uh, possibly only just to hear these announcements, maybe. Uh, <laughs> before I get to that, though, I will point your attention. If you're new here to New Hope Community Church, uh, maybe this is your first day, you can grab one of these pink cards in the front of you. Fill that out, stay in the offering basket, and we promise not to call you or text you or send you any emails, but through the snail mail, we will send you some information about New York Community Church that we hope will be of some benefit to you. Um, I was handed a note this morning to be praying for Michelle uh, Schaefer, who is having an MRI today. Something going on with her hands. Do you remember to pray for her? February is a busy month. A lot of things going on here in February and at the end of the month here coming up. Uh, I'll share a few of those with you. A small group leaders meeting, excuse me, on uh, February 9th. Oh, by the way, you're probably wondering why I'm talking instead of Gene or Tim, aren't you? No? <laughs> I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, Pastor Tim, as you well know, is in Africa. Now, I'm told... And he's with there. He's there with uh, Katie Cole and Lindsay Eccles, by the way. And I'm told that the crew took a uh, couple of mile journey walk outside of the uh, place where they were staying to meet at a church this morning. And Tim preached a sermon there in the village with the uh, I see if I say it right. Ivoronians? Did I say that right? Ivoronians. And I suspect that's because they're in the Ivory Coast. Okay. So anyway, it was a two-hour message, so it was right up Tim's alley. And anyway, so apparently they're pretty stoic people, but there are a lot of tears that morning, and uh, Grace has overcome that place. So praise God for the work that's going on there in Africa. Now, Gene isn't here speaking with you this morning because he's home recovering from his surgery, and uh, I got a... Uh, text message last night that I didn't receive, and a phone call this morning, which I did receive, asking if I can do the announcement because he had an adverse reaction to his uh, anesthesia. So I don't know what that means, I do. so I'm just going to go ahead and guess and say that he has rashes and boils and things like that. <laughs> 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 sure that you know, it's the best for offices, there's something wrong with your skin. Uh, <laughs> No, but he's, uh, he's doing okay. He's just in a lot of pain this morning. So be praying for uh, our pastor team. We well loved. All right. Back to the small group leaders meeting February 9th, 1045, in the Holy Ground. So if you are a small group leader, you want to make sure that you're there. February 11th, seniors luncheon. Some of you are old enough to go to the seniors luncheon. Some of you aren't. I tend to crash it. I say that I'm not old enough, but I like the food. So if you like food, also go to the seniors luncheon. The next one is... Uh, February 11th at 12 o'clock noon. February 12th, fire rehearsal 14. Uh, Melissa is taking the surf group on an expedition to St. Mark Center where they get to hear from a number of Christian bands there at the, uh, at the Roadshow Rock concert. So it's a pretty cool event. It's only 10 bucks. If you have a child or grandchild that's in fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, make sure that you contact Melissa and get them on board for that. Ten bucks, you cannot get a cheaper babysitter on February 14th at Valentine's Day, husband. February 16th, <laughs> women's event. Now, I've been asked to share a couple of things with you regarding the women's event. The first thing is, uh, those tickets that are on sale out in the pavilion, today is your last day to get a ticket for that women's luncheon, so be sure to do that. Also, there will be a car pool leaving from the parking lot here at New Hope to the event, so if you would like to be a part of that carpool in one of two fashions, you can do that by calling the office. Those two fashions are, one, if you can drive and you don't mind having other people in your car, they would love to hear from you, and also, if you'd like to be a part of the carpool, but you're not willing to drive, they need to hear from you, so make sure that you call the office today. Do that okay? All right. Moving forward, uh, board meeting February 20th, so you board members that tend to forget, make sure that you show up on that. And very, very important, February 23rd, there's an all-church business meeting. So many of you know, some of you don't, this church is congregation-led. Uh, and what that means is that you who are members have a vote in what happens here. So it's really important that you show up to these business meetings 
make sure that this church stays as we claim that it is. That it's led by you and not a handful of people who think they know better than everybody else. Amen? That's a good way to be. Make sure that you show up and cast your vote on that day. What else is going on? There is a marriage conference. Uh, the date on that is March 7th and 8th. And there is a sign up sheet that will be going around on this clipboard that I'll send around. We, there's only one, so make sure that once it gets to the back there, there's no support up here. But uh, on here is a sheet. If you'd like to provide meals, it's an excellent opportunity for those of you who know how to cook. I will not be signing this because I doubt people like my microwave, microwave macaroni and cheese. Uh, but if you can cook a little something and you'd like to be a blessing to a family who's in need, it's usually when somebody's in the hospital, somebody just had a baby, and uh, it's, it's a rough time where, you know, it's rough water, right? And so we can be a blessing and many, many times uh, in this church's history. This has been the tool that reached somebody's heart and kind of led them to investigate their faith a little farther and dive a little deeper with God. It's, uh, it's amazing what can happen when you just simply feed people. Jesus did that too, didn't he? Yeah. But anyway, if you'd like to do that, also the marriage conference the sign up sheet is on here. So if you want to be part of that, make sure you get your name on that. And also, maybe this question. All right. What else is going on? Anything I'm forgetting, you guys? Looks pretty good, I think. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to receive our morning guys. <coughs> Will you pray for me? Father, it's another morning uh, where I must confess that uh, whatever you have planned for us in the day is not necessarily something that I feel like I'm prepared for. But God, I also believe that you don't ask of us what we can't handle. So God, just uh, give us the strength in this morning to... Uh, so first hear from you, God, and then to leave these doors and do something. We thank you for uh, Pastor Tim, for Katie, for Lindsay, for their work in Africa. It's just lifting this church up, God, giving us um, eyes to see and ears to hear, God. The things that break your heart, we pray, you would break ours. And Lord, this little church in the valley can make a difference in your name. We pray, God, that uh, these blessings that you've given us as we take a small portion and give them back to you, they be used to lift your name. That God, you'd be glorified, that you would be honored by our um, sacrificial, yes, but hilarious God, uh, gifts. That we would just so happy to give what we can. Thank you for the work that you're doing in and through this church, God. We pray for, uh, for Michelle and uh, we pray for Jean. We know that, Lord, you're with them because we can see you in their hearts and we fall from their lips. God, just remind them of your presence, give them your, your strength and your encouragement this morning. For those, God, who are here, and they're just, they're desperate. They're desperate for answers. I pray, God, that you touch their hearts this morning. That in some small way, you would reveal yourself to them, that they would be overwhelmed with your love today. Thank you for Tim Kepler for the work that he's doing. With the worship team, and God, for the mighty word that he will share. God, uh, thank you for the work that you've done in his life. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. In your son's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Amen. All right, I am so happy to be here with you. And uh, Pastor Tim asked if I would share the message with you this week because he would be out of town. And so I was honored. He sent me this awesome text that said, Hey, my twin, how are you? <laughs> Sounds just like Pastor Tim, right? So if you want to pretend I'm him this morning with like a really good suntan, that's okay. <laughs> I don't think he's as good as he does, but uh, I'm really honored to be here with you this morning. He also asked if I would share a little bit of my story with you, and I thought to myself, wow, that'd be awesome because I've really grown to love the church people here, and I really feel like I've made a connection with a lot of you, and I'm really struggling to learn your names because... You know, when you're up front, everyone knows your name, and you don't know anyone's name, and so I get tired of going, hey, how you doing? And so I really try to make a point to ask people their names over and over and over. I know some of us get a little frustrated because I forget the name. Some of us sit right in this area, right over here, right on the side of this good-looking guy right here. But His name's uh, Scott! <laughs> but anyway, um, I really grow to love the church and the people here, and when Tim asked me to 
share my testimony. I thought, wow, what an honor. So it's really an honor for me to be here today and to be able to share a little bit of my story with you and kind of just give you a little bit uh, greater insight on um, my testimony and what God has done in my life. Um, I was born in Riverside, California, and my mother went into the hospital to give birth to me. She gave birth to me, and she wrote on a napkin, please find a good home for my son. And she left the hospital, and I never saw her again. I was adopted a couple months later uh, through the Riverside, uh, County, Riverside County Adoption Agency, <coughs> and I was placed in a very loving Christian home. Um, my parents raised me like their own. You see, they had five kids of their own, but they were very poor when they raised their kids. So when they started doing better in life, my father worked his way up from a janitor to the superintendent of schools, and my foster father. And so they wanted to bring up kids differently. So they adopted three of us. And I would have to say that their natural kids were a little bit envious because we had everything. <laughs> I mean, they were my adopted parents, but they raised me like their own kids. They bought me nice clothes. They took me to nice places. And I had motorcycles. And we had camping. And, you know, we had go-karts and the latest mini bikes. And we had all kinds of stuff. I had a great upbringing. Well, when I was 16 years old, one morning, real early, I would say it was probably three or four in the morning, I heard my mother and my father talking in the kitchen. And I thought that was very unusual because I'm not really used to them having those conversations early in the morning like that. So I walked out, and my dad was sitting in the chair, and my mother was sitting there with her arm on my dad's shoulder. And the last words I heard my dad say was, Honey, I believe you died. And he fell over and he died. I would have to tell you that my whole world was shaken when I lost my father. Because he was my rock, he was my foundation, he was everything. We did everything together. On the weekends when I had to do my paper route, he would, he would take me in the car and I would throw my papers from the back of our station wagon. I mean, and when my dad died, it left a big hole, a big boy in my heart. And like with many of us, sometimes we suffer tragedy. We turn away from the plan that God has for us. And me that I was raised in church, I turned away from the plan that God had for my life. You see, I started to ditch school, and I started to smoke marijuana, and I started to sell little marijuana joints at school, and I actually got caught one time smoking it at school in the baseball dugouts. And I continued on this path for 10 years. I, find, I realized one day that I could make money selling marijuana, Selling joints for quarter ounces, quarter ounces for quarter pounds, and before you know it, I was selling pounds and pounds of marijuana. I had lots of money in my pocket. I was driving a really nice car. I had girls. I had music equipment. I had my own apartment. I thought I had everything that I needed. But you see, I know now that we all have a hole in our heart. We all have this God-shaped hole in our heart that only Christ can fill. And for ten years, I tried to fill that hole and stuff that hole because of all the hurt, all the pain. My father. I tried to fill that hole with everything but the love of Christ. And you know what I found out? Nothing can fill that hole. Nothing can fill that hole in that boy. Not money, not girls, not cars, not nice things, not nice furniture or a nice house. None of those things can fill that boy. All those things I know now were empty. So one day I just come from buying a bunch of marijuana and I walked into my apartment and I opened up the door and guess who was waiting for me? The police. Yeah. Surprise! <laughs> they took me to jail. I stayed in jail for a couple days and they let me out of what's called whole bar, which means I didn't have a record. I hadn't had any prior arrest record for any got me in trouble. I managed to steer clear of the police for 10 years. So they let me out on probation and they said, don't get me in any more trouble. But you see, that wasn't enough for me because I was still trying to fill that hole. I was still trying to fill that void for that hurt and that pain. I was still trying to fill it with everything but the love of Christ. And right around that time, my brothers were also doing drugs, but they were doing much harder drugs. They were doing a drug called cocaine. And so they convinced me to sell cocaine because they were just amazed that I could make so much money just selling marijuana. So they convinced me to try to sell cocaine, but you see, there was a problem. If I bought 10 pounds of marijuana, and I smoked a quarter ounce of it, so what? But if I bought an ounce of cocaine and I started doing it, 
Well, guess what happened? I got heavily addicted to cocaine. And before I knew it, I lost all my possessions. I lost my car. I was actually driving a Porsche uh, about when I was 22. I lost my car. I lost my apartment. I lost all my friends. And now I'm heavily addicted to cocaine. And I'm living on the streets. I'm sleeping in abandoned buildings. I'm sleeping in what they call crack houses. A crack house is an abandoned building where drug addicts break in and they go inside and do their drugs. That's what my life is reduced. I got caught a second time, which means I violated it. So I had to do time. I went to Riverside County Jail. I went from Riverside County Jail to Chino State Penitentiary. And Chino was a deception yard. And what that meant was when they found a permanent home for you to do your time, they sent me there. And one day they said, Kevin, and I had to say my number, E27358. It's amazing to me, I can't forget that number. Yeah. And they said, roll it up. And I said, where am I going? They said, you're going to Folsom State Penitentiary. I don't know if many of you know about the reputation of Folsom, but Folsom is a very notorious prison. Lots of gangs, lots of violence, lots of really bad things. The next day, I was shackled and hands and foot on a bus. The next morning, I woke up in an 8x10 cell with a guy who was locked up for murder. And I began to talk to myself. I told myself, I don't belong here. I don't belong here. Why am I here? I don't belong here. But the truth was, I did belong here. I belong here because I don't belong. But I guess what I was really trying to say was I was raised better than this. My parents taught me better than that. I should not be here because I should follow my parents' instruction and I should stay with God. That's what I really was saying. And one day I laid on my bed and I began to cry out to God. And God gave me a song. And the name of that song is called Take My Hand. And the song talks about what God told me in prison. He goes, Take my hand, I'll show you who I am. Would you believe I've always been there? Touch the hand of the great I am. Would you believe I've always been there for you? That was God speaking to me. And it was so amazing to me that even though I rebelled against you, God, and I turned against you, I did drugs. I robbed, I stole so that I could get drugs. And you tell me in the midst of me doing all of that, you're telling me that you were always there for me? That's amazing. Who, who has that kind of love? I totally developed against your plan for my life. I totally turn away from you. I do all this stuff, all the sin and stuff that I do. And you're telling me that you have always been only God can have the capacity to love like that. Yeah. Only He can do that. It's like someone punching you in the face and then you say, I love you, I love you, I love you. <coughs> God did that. And so I decided that day in prison that I didn't want to live that way anymore. That was not the life that I wanted to live. So I made a commitment that I was going to live for and one day it was time for me to go home. So they put us in the lineup. And the officer got to each one of us and unshackled us before they released us and gave us our personal items. And when he got to me, he said, You'll be back. I want you to know that those words scared me more than prison itself. Because the odds were that I was going to go back. You see, 80% of the men that go to prison go back. It's just a revolving door. They get out and go back. They get out and go back. They get out and and I knew that. And I continued to say to myself, what am I going to do to stay out of prison? When I got out, going back to my story, after my dad died a few years, my mom died after that. So when I got out of prison, I had a bus pass and $200 in my pocket. I took it back to Riverside. I got off the bus, 
And when he told me honestly, I went straight to the drug house and I got home. The Word of God says that there's a war between the spirit and the what? And the flesh. And whatever is stronger in you, whatever is stronger in me is what we operate in. And the spirit and the flesh, they're always warring against each other. And I was in a war. I was in a battle for my life. I went straight to the crack house. I got high. After getting released from prison within 72 hours, does anyone know what you have to do? Report. Report. Yeah. No, yeah. You have to report. Drug test. And my test was? That's right. Dirty drug test. That's an automatic six months back in prison. Automatic. My boss looked at me and said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Put me in a halfway house. Anyone know what a halfway house is? You're not locked up. But you're not free, you got a lot of rules. One of the rules they had was you had to go to church on Sunday. And I began going to this church on Sunday. I was in the homeless feeding program. I was in the choir. I was in Bible study. And you know what? I was still in the high. And I sat back in the church one day and the pastor gave an altar call. And I came up to the altar and he said, What do you need prayer for? And I said, Pastor, I need finances, which was not the truth. Because if I had money, what was I going to do? I was going to go get drunk. And there's a lesson to be learned in this because I really believe that the Holy Spirit can tell the man of God or man or woman, or woman of God what to pray for. And he began to pray for me that day. And at the end of his prayer, he said, Lord, I will deliver this brother from drunk. And I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, oh, that's the Where did that come from? You know? But I wanted to go be cheerful with you today. That day, I was set free. I was released from the bondage. God took that desire away. Because you see, I really, I didn't want to do drugs. I would go get paid and make money, and then I would go buy drugs and spend it all. And I would lay in bed and cry because I didn't want to live that way. But that day, something special happened. Something different happened. He, he took the desire to do drugs away. Shortly after that, I met my wife. I had two beautiful kids. Didn't have a job, so I took a bucket of paint and a roller, and I began to go out and knock on doors and paint over the TV. And then pretty soon I was painting over garage doors for people. And then pretty soon associations were giving me work, paint little patio numbers and paint. And then I went to school and I got my contractor's license. So I got my license and I started painting homes for people. And before you know it, I was painting multi-million dollar homes down in Huntington Harbor, one house after another. God, I'm truly blessed to work in my hands. And so if anyone would have told me back then that I would be where I am today, I never would have thought it would be possible to you. But you see, through God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, so I'd like to turn to John. We're going to share God's word with you. Today. John 4, I'm going to read verse 4 to 26. If you have a Bible, you can hold it up. Hold up your Bible. This is my Bible. Say that. I believe what it says. I believe this is the Word of God. Lord God, as we go through your Word today, I pray that you would make it real to us and that it would inspire us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now the question I would like to ask you today is what testimony has God given you? You see, God has given us all our own unique story. And what I've learned is that our testimonies can be very powerful tools that God can use to build His kingdom. Many times we may not even realize the impact of our story and how it may impact the life of someone else. I have a friend named Tom. Tom is a gifted, gifted musician. And one day, one of his friends decided to invite him to McDonald's because Tom wasn't a Christian. And Tom liked McDonald's. He loves her coffee. He loves her Big Macs. And his friend knew that. And so he invited Tom. Hey, Tom, let's go have a Big Mac. He began to talk to Tom. Shared Tom his testimony. Tom was a very intellectual person. He began to ask questions. And he began to ask more questions. And before the end of that day, Tom gave his life to Christ and became a Christian. Because someone cared enough to ask Tom out to share a Big Mac. And he took the time to share his testimony. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the one about the woman at the well. 
Oh, we're going to read that one. Okay? John 4, 14, 26. Now he had gone through Samaria, talking about Jesus. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychon, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well, as it was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because he's God. That's all. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But the water, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become to them a spring of water well, well enough to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. She has no idea what he's talking about. <clears throat> or she has no idea that today is a day of destiny. <coughs> he told her, Go. It's funny. I love this because... Jesus asked the question that he already knows the answer to. I have asked myself, why did he do that? Because I believe he was testing her heart. He wanted to see what her heart was. So he asked her this question. Go call your husband and come back. And the woman replied, I have no husband. She replied, and Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, the fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Hello? He's gone. <laughs> she didn't have a clue yet. She still doesn't know. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim it is the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. You worship what we do for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father sees. God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. So she knows that there is a Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. She still does not know who she's talking to. And Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. Now I read all that to bring you to this short little paragraph. I said all that to set up this one paragraph. Because you see, I've read this I don't know how many times. But this particular time when I read this, something stuck out. Something unique, something different, a new revelation that I've never seen before, or I've never noticed before. And when I read this short little paragraph, I stopped. And I thought, that doesn't even belong in there. It doesn't even fit. Listen to this. Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went. You know, it could have said, then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Then the woman went back to the town and said to the people. So I'm thinking, and I, I stopped, and I'm like, why is that there? Why is that there, God? I'm stuck on this. Why is that there? Lord, why, why, why is that there? And then that still small voice spoke to me. Because you see, as many of us do, and I know I do, before I go to bed at night, I begin to think about all the things that I have to do. How many of us do that? We think about all the things we have to do, and we begin to, we begin to plan all the things that we have to do. And if you're like me, after I think about all the things I have to do, then I start to prioritize all the things that I have to do of what's most important. Now imagine living in a house with no hot water, no 
no cold water, no water to do the dishes, no water to cook, no water to take a bath. So I would imagine that her going to the well was pretty important. Wouldn't you say so? But she had to get water. And so she got up in the morning and she called the cow. <laughs> she called the uh, Omnitrans. How did she get to the well? She walked. So I'm thinking, if I'm her at night, I'm thinking, okay, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta do that, I need water tonight. That was probably at the top of her list for that day. That was her most important plan for the day, was to go and get water at the well. Had to be. But now it says here, Then you want to you know what that tells me? She set her plans aside. And so now I'm beginning to get into revelation. And I go, God, that's awesome. And then God tells me, sometimes we set out our plan, but God gives us a purpose. You see, she had no idea that she was going to have a purpose for her today, that day. Her only plan was to go to the well and get water. And so now I'm beginning to see what God put that in there for. I understand why he put it in there. Then leave the water jar. Because God is telling us, sometimes we have to be willing to set our purpose aside. Sometimes we have to be willing to set our jar down. Because God may have another purpose for us. We have to have our ears open and be ready and be willing to set our jar down. So that God can fulfill his purpose in us. Now let me ask you a question. Is it the woman? Okay, let's read on a little bit. Uh, then leaving her water jar, the women went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of, of the woman's what? Testament. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his word, many more became believers. The woman, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of now, the question I'd like to ask you today, did the woman save the people? <clears throat> no. But did she have a part in saving those people? She had a very big part. Because you know what? God used her as a conduit. And so when I go back to that part that says the woman then leaving her jar, the part that makes no sense to me, why it's in the scripture, now makes sense. Because there's a message in that. There's a purpose for that being in there. Because God is telling us sometimes we have to make ourselves available for His purpose and for His will. We have to set our plans down and be available for God to use us for His purpose. <coughs> Proverbs 19 and 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that we live. I want to encourage you today, and myself, to be a conduit for Christ. I know so many of you are, but sometimes it's so easy for us to be a conduit for our plans. And God's knocking and saying, hey, hey, hey. You see, there could be a person in the aisle of the store that's looking for something and being frustrated. And God could be saying, hey, hey, I know you have to get to Johnny's soccer practice, but go and ask her if she needs help. And you can go and pass that person, hey, are you looking for something? Yeah, I'm looking for things. Perfect cake things. And you might have two of them in your box and know exactly where they are. And it sparks a conversation and invite the person to church. You never know what God's purpose is. So God's saying to me, He's saying to you, <coughs> let's keep our ears open and be willing to lay down our hands for God's purpose. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. And God bless you.